Now as we come to uh, participate in not only speaking but hearing your word, we just ask you for a grace to be upon this next few moments in time that uh, literally there would be a transformation in the heavenly realms and in our personal lives. Give us ears to hear, Jesus. Thanks, because you're so good to us. We love you and we're asking to hear something today. We ask you to calm every spirit. We ask you to um, position us to be hearers today. Uh, so that we go and be doers. But, but first, to hear this word, literally, clearly, uh, precisely, hear it from heaven. I know that this is exactly what you wanted me to say. Um, I don't know how I'll say it, but I know you'll give words. And if you give the right words, then the ears will hear. And uh, your business will be done today, as you want it to be. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. Amen. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Genesis, the, the fourth chapter. I'm talking today about speaking a better word. Speaking a better word, uh, um, somewhere around the corners, uh, maybe under the surface, this is kind of a Father's Day message. It goes a little bit beyond that, but, uh, but we're going to talk about uh, this, this issue of speaking a better word and, and hearing a better word as well in our own life and speaking words into other people's lives, particularly our children. Genesis chapter 4, verse 10, then the Lord said, now let me stop for just a moment and, and help you realize here, this is the story of Cain and Abel. When one brother was jealous of the other brother, Cain gets jealous and in a murderous rage, takes his, his own younger brother's life, and God comes to him and appears to, to Cain, and, and the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to you from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened up its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wander on the earth. Now skip ahead, if you would, please, to uh, the book of Hebrews and the 12th chapter. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, and, and verse, beginning to read in verse 18. Did I, did I hear you turn the pages? Okay, I want, I want, I want you to come with me here. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched, that is burning with fire, to darkness, to gloom, and to storm, to a trumpet blast, or to such a voice speaking words that those who hear it, who heard it, excuse me, begged that no further word be spoken to them, because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to, those, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Now, there's two types of wor words in Scripture. There's two types of words in life. The, we begin after the fall of man and sin. We see God in his love but in his mercy and in his justice having to speak words of rebuke and correction, having to speak words into the lives of his own children that brought um, a clear rebuke to them. But it was, it was born out of love. Not that we always speak that way to each other or as father, I don't always speak that way when I'm rebuking my children or having to discipline them. Sometimes, it's, unfortunately, it's out of anger. And, and we hear words like this, and there's this, there's this um, well, look at, look at some of the words that are used here. What have you done? Have you ever heard that in your own life? What, what have you done? What have you done here? What is, what is your problem? Is it maybe another way of saying this? Now, God is not using the same tones that we would use it towards each other, but, but you see in here still the, the uh, before the new covenant, there's this sense of law, uh, the Bible makes it clear, it's the law, and sometimes it seems here, and especially as we say to one another, there's this very clear, what have you done? Why have you messed up? What's wrong with you? Now you are under a curse. There are people in this room today that feel like they, they walked into this room and their life is just a curse. Just one series after another thing uh, an event goes wrong after wrong after wrong. I've even seen and heard Christians talk like this. I, I get the impression that some believers think that life under God's care is a series of events he orchestrates that are trials, tribulations, troubles, uh, terrors, calamities, crisis, 
conflict. And, and then, after you go through all these things, but it's okay because he gives you a little bit of peace in the storm. Oh, good. But then there's more calamity and more crisis and more storm and, and, and judgment coming and rough, everything's, and it's going to be miserable and it's going to be hardship. And then, then, but it's okay, hang on, because there's, in the midst of the storm, there's a, there's a little bit of peace. You can have a little joy there. But then comes the, you know, it's just like, oh. And it's just their whole mentality is just pretty much God has uh, set up the world to be a place of despair and chaos. And the best you can do is get a glimmer of little teensy weensy bit of joy and hang on to that. Hopefully it's enough to get to heaven, then everything will be better. But... And, and so there's this sense, whether you're, particularly if you're not a Christian, people feel under the curse, but even sometimes Christians, don't they, will, will feel like or act like or have this false belief that they're under a curse. The, the, the other part of this, this, this voice of Abel that's speaking from the ground, and that, that's what it actually, God actually says this, is, is it's a, listen, your brother's um, blood cries out from the ground. You hear this voice coming up from the ground, and, and, and in such words as, when you work, you're not going to see the fruit from your work. You're not going to be able to, in other words, you're not going to accomplish what you want with your life. Try what you may, uh, believe what you want, hope what you want, but in the final analysis, you're not going to succeed. You're going to be a failure. That's, that's the voice of the blood of Abel, so to speak. You, you'll be restless. You'll be a wanderer. You're, in other words, you're not going to be able to settle down. You won't, you're going to have a hard time you know, having a family because you're, 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 you're so confused and you're so always dreaming and concocting new plans and ideas. So, so you get the picture here. This, this voice from the blood of Abel is, is, is coming up and, and it's accusing. There, there's this sense of something's, something's wrong with you and... And, and, and then we go into the New Testament and we, we think, okay, good. Now, in the New Testament, things are going to change, but you get Hebrews 12, 18, and you see here there's this mountain that God's talking about. It says you can't touch it. Uh, if you touch it, you'd be like, even if an animal touches it, the, the animal has to be stoned. Uh, there's a sense of an uncleanness, and this, this mountain's burning with fire, with darkness, with gloom, with storm. A voice speaks to it that nobody wants to hear. It causes too much fear. Moses, one of the most holy men in the world, says, this, this place terrifies me. Now, here's the problem. Now, I say all that, and uh, some, I feel like my words aren't quite as exact as I'd like them to be, but, but, but I think here's what I believe God's trying to say, is that these situations are things that we tend to still cling on to. We hold on to these words as if God were saying them to you today, in this hour, in this generation, even those who are under the blood of Christ. Still hearing the, the Father's voice as being a voice of accusation. You see, a lot of people, maybe this will make sense to you, a lot of people really love the New Testament Jesus. You know, I mean, he had cool, long, gold hair. Um, Howard Johnson's bathrobe on. It was, you know, he didn't care about how he looked, so he was cool. Um, and uh, he said these wonderful things, nice sayings that make you feel good inside sometimes. And then he was against the bad guys, so you really, you're on his side. You know, Jesus, New Testament Jesus. And, I mean, even people that don't love God like Jesus. Is that right? They, they think, you know, they'll quote him about peace or... I mean, even people that use drugs say, you know, like they know the verse about every green thing from the field is given by God. You know, they, it's like, it's, it's, there's a sense of Jesus is sort of counterculture, and he's hip, and he's cool, and he would live in Seattle, and, and he would protest, you know, the uh, nuclear arms and, and things.